Kelly Perone. I'm the Education and Outreach Director here at Poema. Um, so I lead all of the public trainings as well as work with our volunteers. We have over 600 volunteers at Poema. Um, so they definitely keep me busy. Uh, it's a lot of fun and one of the ways that, one of the biggest ways that our volunteers serve with us is through the outreach program that you were just talking about. Um, we have over 12 campuses and two new ones joining. Um, I'll go into that a little bit later, but um, it's a really amazing opportunity to spread awareness in your community um, and to also help look for these missing kids that we'll talk about a little bit later by handing out these missing kids posters. Um, Previously, prior to this role, I worked as a victim's advocate, so I worked directly with minors that were recovered from sex trafficking in five different counties in North Texas. Um, and so it was, I, I, it's like unexplainable, the things that you see and the stories that you hear. Um, the darkest and heaviest part of the world, truly. Um, and uh, a lot of times when I would tell people what I did for a living when I was an advocate they would ask me if I worked with a lot of girls from India or you know somewhere overseas not in America and I would tell them no I work with people right here in Dallas County and their jaws would just hit the floor because they're like that doesn't happen over here oh, and I didn't realize they did not they did not <clears throat> yeah and so I realized through telling people that, that there's a lot of people still out there that don't know <clears throat> that this is existing. So that's where my heart for education came in and just really moving into this role, teaching people that this is happening right here in our hometowns. Yeah, um, and all of our social media and just so many different outlets that this is happening through. So um, opening up with that, today I'll be, our first training will be HT 101. So um, the basics of human trafficking. What is human trafficking? Where does it happen? How do people get coerced into the lifestyle? What do the traffickers look like? All these different things. So the basic, and then we'll move into the next two trainings from there. Um, but starting out, I wanna start at the baseline. What is human trafficking? So the Trafficking Protecting, Protecting Act was passed over 20 years ago. So we're making a lot of progress, um, but there is, like I said, still a lot of this that is under the rug, um, and a lot of people that don't know that this is going on. Human trafficking is a modern form of slavery. It involves controlling a person through force, fraud, and coercion to exploit that victim for forced labor, sexual exploitation, or both. Um, the Polar Ice Project, which is a huge resource that we use at Poema, um, I would definitely encourage you to look up their website. They have tons of educational videos and all different kinds of things that will educate you further. Polar Ice Project? Polar Ice, P-O-L, yeah. Um, amazing website, lots of facts and uh, statistics on there for educational purposes. But they define human trafficking as the business of stealing freedom for profit. I really like the way that they word that because that's exactly what this is. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the whole umbrella of human trafficking, but anybody under the age of 18, so minors, all that I worked with um, in my previous role, any time a sexual act is sold for any type of money exchange, that is trafficking. So there, ha there doesn't have to be any signs of force, fraud, or coercion. If the victim is under 18, it's automatically classified as trafficking, um, which is really great because it wasn't always that way. Um, previously, before there was a lot of knowledge and education on this topic, anyone who was selling any kind of sexual act or was forced into this labor, it was just arrested and gone straight to jail. Um, and now that there is the Protecting Act and there's more education coming out about this, about this is what trafficking looks like and these people are forced into this um, by being manipulated and coerced and made all these false promises, now they're seeing this as this is not a crime on the victim's part, this is a crime on the trafficker's part. So there's been this refocus on arresting the trafficker and the people buying the sex um, rather than the person performing the acts, which would be the victim in this case. Um, there is also a huge difference between trafficking and smuggling. So a lot of people, like the people I was talking about before that were like, that happens overseas, that doesn't happen over here in America. Smuggling is when is a business of transporting people across state borders um, or international borders. 
So that's what a lot of people define as trafficking, bringing people over into America for marriage proposals or promises of a new job, different things like that. That would be smuggling across an international border. Trafficking, on the other hand, involves that force, fraud, and coercion. So forcing somebody into a job, coercing them, manipulating them, telling them that this is going to make your life so much better and making all these false promises to them. So definitely a huge difference between those two things. Um, and has caused a lot of the confusion. Um, trafficking, unlike smuggling, does not necessarily involve movement or transportation. Um, as somebody can be trafficked from their very own home, which a lot of people are not aware of. There was quite a few <coughs> girls and boys I worked with in my previous role that went to school during the day and then were walking the strip at night. And because their trafficker told them, like, if you don't do this for me, I'm going to kill a family member or I'm going to do this or, you know, all these different things. But you would never suspect somebody who's in school during the day is doing this at night. So the thing is to look out for all of these different, um, all of the different things to look out for is to be educated on so that you can see like, yes, this person looks like they'd be living a very normal lifestyle, but they're actually a trafficking victim. So international trafficking, as we touched on, um, most people I speak with know that this is going on. Um, 24.9 million victims globally are exploited through international human trafficking. $150 billion industry. Um, and what are some of the things that make people susceptible to being a international trafficking victim is recent migration into a different country, relocation, these both create vulnerabilities, uh, marriage propositions, promise of a citizenship or a new job in America. Um, so we see this a lot with the border issue at Mexico and um, everything happening in the Ukraine. There's a ton of trafficking going on over there. Why? Because those people are extremely vulnerable. They're coming into a new country, they don't have a job lined up, they don't have somewhere to live, and traffickers know that, so they know to go down to the border, they know to talk to them and make promises of, I have a job lined up for you, it's amazing, pays so much, you know what, there's a house right down the road, all these different things that they'll tell them, and all these lies that they'll feed them that they're vulnerable, they don't know. They're, they're believing like this promise of a better life and that's why they're coming to America or that's why they're fleeing Ukraine. So all these different things that make people vulnerable to international trafficking. Swoping down a little bit closer to home, what does trafficking look like in America? So trafficking has been reported in all 50 states in America, so definitely close to home, happening right here in our country. Um, this map, if you'll, you can see this, these are all the calls that came into the national trafficking hotline. So these are not hubs of where the most trafficking is happening. This is where all the calls are coming in. So people like you all today that are getting educated and are seeing something in the public that just looks a little bit off and they're calling into that national human trafficking hotline saying like, hey, I saw something that looked just a little suspicious, could be a trafficking situation, might not be, but I wanted to call it in just in case. Um, and then also victims that are calling in and saying like, hey, I'm being trafficked like what can we do next how can i get recovered from this situation um so all different kinds of situations like that these are all the calls that came in so if you can see all the highlighted red areas um those are where the most calls have come in so dallas county houston um all along the sea borders <coughs> but as you can see nevada has absolutely no lights lit up and vegas is a huge hub for trafficking tons of brothels tons of prostitution rings, um, but there's nobody educated enough to make these calls. So this is something that we're super passionate about, equipping people with the National Human Trafficking Hotline so that you guys can be equipped to call in anytime you see something um, that looks suspicious. So what does this look like in Texas? One of the biggest statistics that sticks out to me is 79,000 minors are exploited um, and are victims of sex trafficking in Texas alone. 313,000 victims of human trafficking in general, so that will include sex trafficking, labor trafficking, um, all the different types of trafficking, but sex trafficking is driving the force worldwide. Um, because there is a demand for sex and traffickers know how to provide for that demand. So it is simply supply and demand. Um, traffickers are exploiting $600 million in the state of Texas. So as we can see, this is a huge issue here in our state, um, especially with minors. So um, 
the demand for having sex with a minor is skyrocketing. I mean, it is astronomical how much people are willing to pay um, and how many minors that traffickers are exploiting to meet that demand. <clears throat> what do high-risk youth look like in Texas? So how does this kind of branch into um, becoming all of these statistics? So in Texas, there are 3,763 missing kids reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, and according to that center, one in six missing kids is likely a victim of sex trafficking. So if you think about, there's almost 4,000 missing kids, one in six of those is likely to be picked up by a trafficker. How many kids that is that are just constantly being picked up, running away and being picked up by a trafficker over and over and over again. <clears throat> um, running away is a huge vulnerability for minors getting into sex trafficking. It is reported that within 48 hours of a kid running away, they'll be picked up by a trafficker. And this is exactly the thing we were just talking about. Traffickers know what to look for. They know the vulnerabilities to prey on. They know exactly what a kid looks like running away from home. The nervous tendencies, the little backpack, the having absolutely no idea where they're at, looking for anybody to validate them. They know all of those things to look for, and they're gonna exploit that, and they're gonna make these promises to them that, hey, you can get a ride with me. You don't need to ride the bus. Um, I have a safe place where you can stay for the night, and then you can figure out things in the morning. I have a hot meal for you. You know, just, just come hang out with me for a little while. And they know exactly how to make it very charming um, and all of these deceitful lies to get them into this situation. So running away, huge vulnerability um, for minors. And like we said, these are the most often exploited and forced into sex trafficking population. Um, according to the Polarized Project, $99 million are generated from trafficking in the city of Dallas alone. So Dallas and Houston go back and forth between being the largest hub for trafficking in Texas. Um, right now, I believe it is Dallas, and it just goes back and forth. They're both huge cities, um, both cities that a lot of people travel to, like you were saying, for the Super Bowl, for big events like that. Any event where you have a lot of middle-aged men that are meeting and their wives are at home or you know they're looking for a good time, get away for the weekend, that's a huge hub for trafficking. Because like with the Super Bowl, I mean, there's a lot of movements that have been, you know, there's all these hashtags and everything trying to raise awareness about the Super Bowl being the biggest sex trafficking event of the year. Um, and why is that? That's because all these men are in one spot and they can buy sex really easily. And there, there were people, my friend lived, or does it now, but she lived Mm -hmm. AT&T Stadium, and there were people coming in wanting to rent out their houses for an astronomical amount of money, and that's what they were using it for, to bring these yeah. men in. Yeah. And these girls. And probably in just a very normal looking neighborhood. Yeah. Nobody I mean, would suspect it. Typical, you know, middle class neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, there's a uh, educational video on the government's website. I think it's on one of our handouts for you guys. But um, there's a couple that actually got a whole sex trafficking ring uh, discovered by the police. They got arrested and all that. They were in a very normal neighborhood. And these people were educated enough to see, like, there's tons of cars coming and going all the time, different cars, never the same ones. Tons of middle-aged men coming in and out of the house. It just doesn't look right. We've never met these neighbors. Nobody's ever seen them outside before. And so they're like, this is just odd. And so they call it in, and sure enough, they had eight young girls in there that they were selling for sex through the house. Totally normal-looking neighborhood home on a cul-de-sac. Nobody would have suspected. But that's exactly what the traffickers do on purpose. You know, nobody's going to suspect it. She lived really close to AT&T Stadium. Yeah. So they were having a lot of them coming in and going, you know, trying to rent their houses out. And she was in free and not rent. She mm -hmm. didn't, obviously, they didn't tell her what it was for, but she had a pretty good idea. She said, no, I'm not renting out my house to a bunch of strangers, period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good for her. Good for her. Um, so. One of the things that I did a lot of research on was what trafficking looked like in the pandemic. So everything shut down. We're thinking, you know, 
Target's not even open, all these different things. So hopefully at least crime has come to a lull as well. Um, but that was actually the opposite of the case. Trafficking actually thrived during the pandemic. Um, one reason is because human trafficking is extremely adaptable um, and traffickers, like we're talking about, know the vulnerabilities. During co the COVID pandemic, people were extremely vulnerable, um, out of jobs, out of looking for money, you know, grandma's sick, I need to pay for this, all these different things, extremely vulnerable to falling for all these different deceitful lies. Um, and you think about on the other end too, what's everyone doing while they're not at school or at work? They're at home, on their computers, on their laptops, their phones, all of these internet uh, websites and all of these things that traffickers and predators can uh, access them very easily through. Um, so through the online, the online recruitment skyrocketed. Um, Facebook increased 125%, Instagram increased 95%, and then familial trafficking, so a family member trafficking another family member, increased 47% because everyone's at home. So at home with their abusers, their perpetrators, all of those different things who are exploiting them um, and selling them into this. Why couldn't they shut down Facebook and Instagram for yeah, it is illegal, but it's very hidden, um, and they know really, really well how to hide it and how to make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but as you can see, social media is a huge issue and a huge open door to trafficking. Um, that's something we're very passionate about telling people about parents and young kids is you really, I mean, it's, it's been said over and over and over again, like social media is dangerous and all these things. But if you have a kid who has, you know, an eight-year-old kid who has access to the internet, that's the door wide open for predators to just come in. And they know, like we said, exactly what to say and exactly what to look for. Um, and so having those safety features on phones and having your profile just switch to public, I mean, it makes a huge difference. Um, because kids these days have, you know, phones at a really young age, and that's just an open door for anybody to have access to them, especially with internet access, texting, all that different things. A lot of parents don't control what their children are doing. They don't even know what their children are Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Have no idea who they're talking to, what sites they're on, or what apps they're on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Open and to yeah, and the average age um, right now for a child to view pornography for the first time is about eight years old. And so having that um, open access to the internet and learning about sex for the first time through pornography videos just makes this whole lifestyle and sex trafficking just that much more normalized because they're seeing this on videos and they're seeing abuse happen and they're seeing all these things that they come to believe this is what sex looks like, this is what love looks like. Um, and so just normalizing this whole lifestyle, which is exactly what the media and traffickers want to happen, um, to normalize this whole thing so that it stays under the radar. So who are the victims? Who are the people that are being coerced into this lifestyle? One of the biggest vulnerabilities is age. The average age of a trafficking victim is 15 years old. So barely a sophomore, freshman, sophomore in high school. Um, your prefrontal cortex is not even fully formed. You're not even able to make cognitive decisions yet. So like we were talking about with the running away, um, one of the girls that we worked with previously who's on her healing journey was in a panel for us and she told us, Miss, we're not running to something, we're running from something. And so they have a perpetrator at home or an abuser or even just being mad at their mom or dad, you know, just getting away thinking, I'll show them, I'm going to get out of the house. They're just running from something. They're not thinking about, you know, what is my process here? Where am I going to go? What am I going to eat? And they're just getting out. And so they're running to dart stations, um, to bus stations, all these different things where traffickers know to hang out. Um, and then they're getting picked up by traffickers. And um, 
the issue that impacts it, it impacts both boys and girls. It's not just girls. Um, I have worked with mostly females, and then Poema, our safe house, is mostly females. Um, but it is a growing issue amongst boys as well. Um, they're actually starting a lot of campaigns and awareness around boy male trafficking. Um, it's even more hidden than female trafficking because guys are taught to stuff everything down and not talk about abuse or not be um, manipulated over or um, powered over because they're supposed to be this powerful male figure, all these different things. Um, the next one is mental illness. So traffickers know to prey on mental illness as well. Um, just makes them that much more vulnerable um, and susceptible to falling for traffickers' lies and manipulation. I worked with a girl who was 15 years old in my previous role who had multiple personality disorder. Um, and she, was, she had two different traffickers, actually. And I'm sitting across from this girl at a mental facility the day that she got recovered from her trafficker. And I can't even carry on a conversation with her because all of these different personalities are coming out. Um, and it's very difficult to talk to her and talk to all of these different people that are just coming out one by one. Um, but multiple personality disorder is an aftermath um, symptom of trauma that you had to go through as a child. And so having to take on all these different personalities to cope with all of these different abuses or whatever you went through as a child, that's where you develop that multiple personality disorder. And so working with her for two years and walking through life with her um, and just showing her a healing and healthy relationship and getting her back into school and to counseling and um, meeting with her each week and talking about everything going on and walking through her healing process with her, I was able to see her heal so much. And it was amazing to see all that the Lord did through her life um, just by having a healthy relationship in her life because she never had one of those before. You know, home life wasn't healthy. And then she had two traffickers that were selling her and exploiting her body. Um, and just through this healing journey, counseling and getting to, you know, heal through all of the trauma that she had experienced. Um, but huge vulnerability for traffickers to prey on because you're just that much more susceptible um, to believing all these different things and wanting a better life than you do right now and believing anybody who promises to give that to you. The next one is history of trauma or abuse. So the statistics show that one in four girls and two in seven boys are physically or sexually abused prior to running away. Um, so like we were saying, running away from perpetrator or abuser in the home or in the neighborhood, in the church even, uh, we've seen a lot. Um, running away from that and getting out and then getting picked up by a trafficker who's telling them, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I'll show you a better life. I'll be the dad figure that you don't have or I'll be the, you know, the breadwinner. I'll make sure you have clothes on your back and food on your table um, and making all these false promises to them. Um, this is also something that we as the public need to be very trained to see because it's not always the kid that's acting out or the kid that's getting in trouble. It can be the girl with the straight A's or the guy on the football team. That's why it's really important to be able to read the signs and have conversations with um, kids, whether you're a teacher or a parent, grandparent, anything like that, and be able to detect these signs. Um, the next one is runaways, which we touched on a little bit before. Um, according to the um, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, 86% of child sex trafficking victims were children from foster or group homes. Um, so this is something I've seen a lot in working with victims of sex trafficking. Um, there's not a lot of supervision in foster homes a lot of times. Um, there are some amazing foster homes out there, amazing foster parents, um, but there also are some that um, there's not a lot of supervision, and there's not a lot of love in the home, or there's a lot of abuse in the home. Um, and so this 86% that's coming from these foster group homes is a huge statistic for you know all these kids that are being adopted into these new homes or are coming out of CPS or all of these different things um, and just making them that much more vulnerable. We talked with a kid one time who had been in the CPS, uh, Child Protective Services industry 
um, I think like 10 years. So she, she had just grown up in CPS and bounced around from foster home to foster home. And she's like, I mean, it grooms you for trafficking because you're constantly having to pack up your bags, move to a different place. You're having to get to know um, new parents, new people all the time. You're in new situations, new neighborhoods. She's like, it's the same as trafficking because we're constantly moving, constantly keeping a bag on our shoulder, constantly going through. And that was really eye-opening for us because this is something that was created to keep kids safe, but in a way is, you know, a gateway into all of these different things. Um, and so I know a lot of caseworkers I've worked with are being more and more educated on trafficking um, and so know what to look out for in foster parents, um, what to look out for in these homes, and to make sure they're placing these kids in safe homes where there's not a perpetrator. The last one is dysfunction or drug use at home. Um, one of the biggest things that we see is called heroin sickness. So this is when um, a victim is extremely um, paralyzingly addicted to a drug, so in this case heroin, um, to where they physically and emotionally need that next fix. Um, and traffickers will often supply the drugs to them and get them hooked on it um, to where they're dependent on it. And then by the time they need and are, you know, their body just needs that next fix, the trafficker's telling them, well, I don't have enough money to cover the next round of drugs. If you have sex with my friend, that can pay for the next round of drugs. And then you'll feel so much better. You'll get your next fix. And when you have that physical dependency on a drug, you'll do anything to get that next fix. So falling prey to doing anything, absolutely anything to get that money for that next drug, that next fix. Um, this is often a, a way that traffickers get people to be dependent on them is being their drug dealer as well. Um, the next one is who are these traffickers? So this photo right here, um, super swag looking guy, has a matching uh, suit and car. This is stereotypically what a lot of people think a pimp looks like. Looks a lot like uh, Snoop Dogg, who actually yeah. was a pimp. He um, would show up to his shows with a busload of girls and sell them for sex after his concerts. Um, and so, but these other three photos are also pimps. And traffickers so these three photos are people of um, that have trafficked and exploited um, children and women all over the country um, as you can see right here this bottom left picture this is Nathan Tatarko he was in the Marines um, he trafficked a 14 year old girl he was driving by the road one time saw this girl on the side of the road it was raining outside you know, rolled down the window, offered her a ride. Hey, it's really cold out here. It's raining. How about I give you a ride wherever you're going? She gets in the car. He has sex with her. And then he gives her drugs and alcohol. And then he ends up selling her to a brothel. Um, and she dances, makes money. He keeps all the money. Um, he trafficked her for a few months, um, kept control of all her money, of all her social interactions, all these different things. Um, he actually ended up getting caught because he got pulled over for a traffic a tail light and the cop was educated enough to look in the car and see something doesn't look right here um, and so he takes them in and sure enough this guy had been trafficking this girl um, sadly enough for this story he only got three years probation from the police department because the victim did not testify against him so we see this very very often um, in our minds, right, I'm thinking like, this person exploited you, they're a perpetrator, they did all these horrible things to you, why would you not testify against them? But think about a 14-year-old girl who, like we said, prefrontal cortex is not even fully formed. She has to stand up on the stand in a courtroom in front of her perpetrator, in front of his lawyer, his family, all these people that are there to make her look like a liar. Um, that's extremely intimidating and terrifying. And so we see this all the time that they just don't want to testify against the pimps or traffickers. Um, 
which is understandable, right? Um, but that is where a lot of these advocacy programs are coming in, where they're letting advocates come in and sit with the girls while they're going through their trial, um, just to be that extra layer of confidence, of security, all those different things. Um, but yeah, three years probation, that is not long enough at all. I'm not sure. Somebody else asked me that last time. I'm not sure, but I would I would really hope so. I would hope so. Yeah. Um, the two people on the top, Shayla Williams and William Jacobs. So Williams, the female, was trafficked when she was 16 years old. Um, and then through working with her trafficker for so long, she became the bottom girl, which is basically the recruiter to bring in other girls um, onto the team um, for the trafficker. There was a 14-year-old girl that they had um, trafficked through social media. So this girl was posting on Twitter about how much she hated living at home and just couldn't wait to get out and would go anywhere but her home. Um, and William sees that and she messages the girl and, you know, just empathizes with her. Like, man, that sucks. Like, you should come live with me and my dad. We have this great big house. He lets me do whatever I want. It's so much fun. And so what does the girl do? She's like, yeah, she's a 14-year-old girl just trying to have fun and not live with her mom who doesn't let her do anything. So she lets Williams come pick her up um, in her home in Allen, Texas, so really close to here. Um, they took her to an extended stay motel. So the second they come to pick her up, she's like, I don't think this is her dad. This is this doesn't look right, but she's already hooked in. Um, they take her to this extended stay motel in Louisville. Um, they both have sex with her, and then they drug her, give her alcohol as well, and then they take pictures of her and put them on a sexual advertising website. So where men can make one click and purchase sex with her or purchase any type of um, sexual act with her. She was trafficked all around the United States. Um, and by the end of, by the time they're getting back to Dallas, she had sex with over 60 men. Um, and so traffic just pulled straight into this lifestyle, brought into all these different states, um, sold over and over and over again. Um, they end up taking her back to that extended stay motel in Louisville where they just abandon her. And so they just leave her there and the police are able to pick her up and she gets recovered. Um, but by then, she's all this has happened yeah and she's been drugged all over the country um forced into all these situations and so so much healing has to take place after that happens um as you can see traffickers can be a family member a friend um a friend or a stranger um, or a boyfriend. So this is the most common one that I've seen. The boyfriend pimp is often known as the Romeo pimp. So this is the kind of trafficker or pimp that really romanticizes um, their victim. And, you know, we'll walk up to them. We've seen this a lot at the mall, which I think is so interesting. Um, but just going up to a girl and telling her how pretty she is, just starting with really small, basic things. And telling her like, hey, that top you're holding, that's really cute. How about if I buy it for you? I can buy you all kinds of things. I can buy you this and we can go on shopping sprees and I can buy you expensive bags and get your nails done and make you feel beautiful all the time. Um, and just slowly lie after lie after lie. All these promises that they were never given, whether they were raised in a home where there was not a lot of money, where they were not able to buy new clothes, or they might have been. They might have lived in a middle-class home where everything was provided for them, but there's somebody coming in telling them that they're beautiful and telling them all these wonderful things that they want to hear about themselves and slowly romanticizing them into this lifestyle, um, only for it to be a vicious cycle at the end where they're met with abuse and then a compliment. And this happens and then they're romanticized again. So just this vicious cycle that they fall into um, and get manipulated and coerced into. Um, with strangers being um, a trafficker, this is something that we don't see as often. And this is a huge point that I wanna make. A lot of people still view trafficking as the white van, uh, the kidnapping, 
handcuffs, different things like that, putting the bag over their head, taking them to an undisclosed location. That does happen, um, but very, very rarely, um, about 10% of the time, truly. Um, all of the girls and boys that I worked with in my previous role as an advocate, I worked with over 200 youth that had been trafficked, and there was one in 200 that that had happened to, that that was the situation of their trafficking story. Um, more often than that is the manipulation, the coercion, the boyfriend who's, you know, romanticizing them into this lifestyle or the friend that acts like, you know, I'm the only person that's there for you, you know, come over and we can talk about it and just like manipulating them over and over and over mm -hmm. again for years sometimes. Um, and just coercing them into believing they're a friend or believing they're a boyfriend um, or a loving family member even. Um, that's the one that's hardest for me to hear and usually for everyone else to hear too is a family member trafficking another family member um, because I know I could never imagine that happening in my household. But um, whether it's a drug addiction or whatever it may be, desperate for money, desperate for rent, um, or mom's boyfriend tells her like, hey, we can sell, you know, so-and-so, and she loves the boyfriend, and she's like, okay, well, you know, we're gonna make rent this month, or whatever it may be, different situations. Um, but that is unfortunately on the uptick, so we're seeing a lot more familial trafficking happening. So what does this recruitment process look like? How are victims recruited into this lifestyle? And why don't they ask for help? So one of the biggest things is coercion and threats. There was a girl in our safe house um, who was trafficked and the reason she kept going back is because the trafficker told her like, if you don't come back to the strip every night after school, I will kill your little sister. And she had seen him kill a girl right in front of her. Um, and so she knew that he would actually do it. He would do what he said he was gonna do. And so every night she would go back out to the strip and sell sex. And um, because he had made this threat to her and she believed he would do it. Um, another one is through coercion and threats is blackmailing. And so taking these photos of them, putting them online, um, telling them like, I'm gonna show your church family these photos, or I'm gonna show your family members or your friends, all of these different things, all of these horrible, disgusting photos of you that you know are inappropriate and all of these things. Um, emotional violence, degrading and shaming them so much that they have no self-confidence, um, believing that they are not good for anything else. All I'm good for is my body, all I can, the only way I can make money is through my body. That's what I've been told over and over and over again. Um, physical violence. So this is often known as the gorilla pimp. So this is the pimp that will um, beat their victims into submission. Um, and this can also constitute with uh, branding or tattooing a victim, forced drug use, um, denying food or other basic needs. The next one is sexual violence, so making victims prostitute, gang rape, withholding sexual intimacy for obedience, um, and sexual humiliation and shaming. Purposeful manipulation, learning their insecurities or their life gaps, so like that father figure, um, and swooping in to say like, I can be that dad in your life, or all these different things. I worked with um, a 17-year-old girl, and as an, her advocate, and she was telling me, so she was trafficked, and then we were working together, got away from her trafficker, all these different things, but she lived in a neighborhood that this, this thing just happened a lot over there. Um, but she didn't have a father figure, just lived with her single mom, there was four kids, and her neighbor knew her family really well, and he would go over there all the time, bring them food, and pick up clothes for them, all these different things. And she never had that. She never had an older male role model or somebody in her life like that. And a few months after knowing him, he is taking her out to eat and all these different things. And I can see, right, as her advocate, this man's grooming you. And he's going to traffic you. You're going to get trafficked all over again. And she's sitting in the car with me. We're on our way to, like, McDonald's or something. And telling me, like, yeah, he said he can be my daddy. And I was like, no, that's no that's not what he means 
and but she's looking and desperate for this daddy figure in her life you know somebody that will do these things for her will make sure she has food on the table and will be there for her and somebody to talk to um, and just filling that role of a father in her life so desperate for it that she's blinded to seeing that this man's actually you know grooming her to traffic her um, and so exploiting those insecurities um, or structural gaps another one is economic dependence so refusing the victim to go to school or taking all the money they make, as we saw in this situation before. Um, one of the huge obstacles that I ran into as an advocate was working with youth that were coming out of the trafficking lifestyle, out of, the, um, out of selling sex. So they're selling sex on the street, making about $500 a night, different things like that. And then we're through this healing process, trying to get them a job um, because they do need to make money, but they need to make it in a way that's not going to destroy them. Um, but then going from $500 a night to $10 an hour at you know Chick-fil-A or McDonald's or something, it's an extremely huge obstacle in telling them, yes, you made so much more money through this, but think about all the things that it did to you physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, and just that huge money gap between the two jobs. Um, the last one is isolation. So isolating the victim from their social supports, uh, making them unfamiliar with um, their surroundings and so that they only have the pimp to rely on. They have no friends around, no family members. Um, they have no idea where they are. Um, this would be, a good example of this would be the girl who was trafficked all around America. She's in different states that she's never been in before, um, doesn't know where the nearest police department is, doesn't know where a hospital is, um, and so completely isolated. <coughs> the next slide, and this is a graph from the Polar Ice Project, that resource I was telling you about. I really appreciate this graph because it shows the top types of trafficking in America. Um, and as you can see, the first one is escorting. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that term, um, but escorting comes off as something that's very harmless. So I saw a lot of victims get coerced into this lifestyle through first escorting. So this can look like um, a girl being paid to go on a date with an older man that you know, he's just lonely and he wants somebody to hang out with or he has an office work party and he'll pay her $200 to be his guest so he doesn't look like he's alone at the party. Um, very interesting, very strange, um, but can often be a gateway into trafficking. Um, the next one is pornography. Um, so like we said before, the average age of a child viewing pornography is eight years old. Um, and so just growing up with that belief that that's what sex looks like, right, um, is a huge obstacle into making them aware that sex trafficking um, and this submissive lifestyle and all of these different characteristics of sex that they're seeing on videos are not what sex actually is. Um, and then on the flip side, pornography being addicted to it it's something that you keep having to fuel over and over again once this is not enough you go to the next level and you go to the next level I had a friend who was an advocate with me um, and her best guy friend in high school had a horrible pornography addiction all through high school um, and he started off just watching you know basic pornography videos or going to Pornhub or whatever and then that wasn't enough to you know fuel him make him feel good anymore so he went to the next level and he would watch you know rape porn or child porn all these different things and next level next level and then once the videos aren't enough then you go on to buying somebody and so he went on he just dug this deep 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 hole and before he knew it he had purchased sex with a 15 year old girl online and was on his way to go meet her and had this realization of like what am I doing how did I get here how did I dig myself so deep into this hole that I'm literally driving on my way to have sex with a 15 year old girl he's like 20 years old at this point so not only is it illegal um, adult to child it's illegal because it's you know he was watching child pornography and it fed so much into the situation that um, his addiction got rampant and uncontrollable. Um, the next slide is trauma bonds. So this is why, this is the huge obstacle of why the, these girls, boys, men, women don't ask for help. Um, a trauma bond is a major hurdle to the identification and restoration of victims. 
Um, the symptoms are failure to self-identify, return to trafficker, refuse help, disjointed memories, aggression, or protecting their pimp. I cannot tell you how many times I was cussed out by a girl that had just gotten, she was recovered off the streets. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Harry Hines Boulevard, but it's a huge trafficking hub area. Um, so oftentimes the girls would come in from Harry Hines, um, they would be walking up and down the strip, the police would pose as a buyer, so in a car, pull up, the girl thinks that she, the window's rolling down, you know, for somebody to buy sex, she's about to get in the car, but turns out it's a police officer. Um, and so that's how they would pick up girls most often. Um, and then, especially once I identified that she was underage, they would pick her up, take her to the police station, and then that's where I would meet them, um, the night that they were recovered. Um, but, um, yeah, but they, I would get there and you'd think a lot of people thought like, wow, this must be such a rewarding job. These girls are getting rescued, but that's not the case at all. They're manipulated into this, right? So they're thinking like, you're taking me away from my lifestyle, the way I make money, my boyfriend, my friends, like, why are you ripping me away from everything I know? Um, and so walking in there and just talking with them about life and just, you know, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. I'm not CPS. I'm not law enforcement. Um, and you know, if you cuss me out, that's okay because I'm here to support you. Um, but that trauma bond to that trafficker, right? That boyfriend or that friend or family member, um, even if your mom is your trafficker, she's still your mom. And so there's that, that, you know, feeling that you still love her. She's still your mother figure. Um, and so just this whole confusion in your head of trying to heal through that while also knowing that she exploited you um, and is your perpetrator. Um, this is why it's important for us to get out of our heads the stereotypical view of victims um, because you often won't see a lot of the symptoms that you think you would as somebody who's being rescued out of this lifestyle. Um, because oftentimes they don't see themselves as a victim. They see themselves as somebody who, this is their job and this is their the way they make their living. Um, Stockholm syndrome is another huge one. So this is where the victim will become attached to their perpetrator and come to their defense, um, protecting them. Um, this is a psychological manipulation tool that traffickers will use. Um, hostages express empathy and have positive feelings towards their captors sometimes to the point of defending them. These feelings are often seen as irrational, um, but essentially mistake a lack of abuse from their captors as an act of kindness. So like, he didn't beat me today, so I know that he really loves me, or you know, he didn't make me have sex today, so I think that our relationship's going better. Just like completely brainwashed and manipulated. Um, this next one is Hortensia Medellis. She's a 68-year-old matriarch pimp. Um, she was arrested and could receive life in prison. Um, she operated two cantinas in Houston, Texas. Cantina in the front and brothel in the back. Um, and she operated these for almost 20 years without anybody ever suspecting anything was going on. <clears throat> she made 1.6 million tax-free dollars in just a little over a year. Um, and so thriving businesswoman making tons of money off of these cantinas that she ran, um, never being caught, never being suspected for anything until, um, after those 20 years, the police finally catch on and catch wind of what's going on. And she knows that they're onto her. So she lays low, you know, backs up from the industry a little bit, but she rents out her business to other pimps who had to pay her $20,000 a week to keep the business up and running. So that's just how much money is in this industry, tons and tons, to where she was able to make almost $2 million off of running this for just a little over a year. Um, and this just goes back to that supply and demand. There is this demand for sex and this lady knew how to supply it. Um, and she's, a, she's 68 years old. She's probably a grandmother, a mom, She's also a woman, which is shocking to me, um, selling all of these sexual acts to make her own profit and her own money. This slide is a picture of a sting that happened in Rockwall, Texas a few years back. 
there was a 15 year old girl um, posted online um, and these eight men are the men that clicked to buy to have sex with her um, they were caught because it was an undercover sting so once they showed up expecting for the girl to open the door um, it was actually the police so they were caught and all brought to jail but something I want to point out about this photo is that there is no one particular race um, or one particular age range. These men range from 21 years old to, I think it is 60 years old. Um, and so just all across the board. But according to Sean McGraw, who's with the FBI, um, he works all across the nation with sex trafficking victims, um, recovering victims all over the country. He says that middle-aged white American males are driving the industry worldwide. Um, why is this? Because they have the time, the money, and the means. So this is not to shame them, but this is to show, shed light on the fact that this is happening and um, in all of these ages. So these are brothers, dads, um, grandfathers, and this is because there is that supply and demand and our um, media is pushing this sex is just everywhere and sex sells. Um, and so just knowing that and being aware of that um, and again not to shame anyone so very heavy stuff um, what can you do as the public being trained on what trafficking looks like and where it happens um, the very best thing you can do is if you see something say something so I would encourage you all to take this um, number down in your phones and anytime you see any suspected trafficking situation you can call this number it is anonymous um, there's also a texting number as well and you can call in and tell them what the situation looks like they'll ask you you know for the location and who the person is that you're calling in to describe them all of those different things um, and they'll send an officer out to check out the situation. So um, doesn't mean anybody's getting arrested or anything you know crazy is going to happen. It's just they're going to go check it out. They're very educated on trafficking situations, and they'll be able to go over there, assess the situation, um, and take steps from there. So in the um, aftermath, what is POEMA doing to combat human trafficking? Um, we, are, we have our four E's which are educate, engage, empower, and eradicate. So we are educating the public, so events like today where we're educating people on what trafficking looks like um, and how you can make a difference. And then we're also engaging the community. So this is through our outreach programs like we were talking about earlier, um, which I'll go into a little bit later. But raising awareness in your communities um, and in the public and helping these missing kids get found before a trafficker finds them. The next one is empowering. So we do this through our safe house. Um, we have a safe house for adult women who have been trafficked, um, walking through that healing journey with them, getting them into counseling, um, helping them get back on their feet and get through that healing process however long they need. I mean, we've had women in the safe house for a few months or a few years um, because everyone's healing journey looks different. And then the last one is eradicating. So this is something that we're just getting started up. We're super excited. Um, a young men's discipleship group. If we can start at the young age um, and with men and showing them that this is not what sex looks like, this is not love, this is not how we treat women, um, then we can hopefully eradicate this issue in the next um, population or age group coming up. These are some photos from our education events. We have educated over um, 20,000 people, um, which is really amazing. And we're super excited for all the opportunities that we've had. These girls are um, sophomores at um, They got educated on sex trafficking, and it struck them so heavily that they started their own podcast, educating their peers on what trafficking looks like. The reason that this is amazing is they're 15, so they're the average age of somebody who is sucked into this lifestyle. So they're able to go into their high school, their friend groups, um, their different clubs, and tell people about what trafficking looks like and reach their peers even better than we could reach them as the public, you know what I'm saying? So starting this um, podcast up and educating everybody on trafficking.
This is another girl who started up a TikTok channel um, teaching people about human trafficking. So this is our community awareness outreach program. Um, these are a few uh, pictures of the missing kids posters that we take to motels, hotels, uh, grocery stores, gas stations, um, take them out into the community so we can get more people involved in trying to find the, these missing kids. Um, like I said before, a trafficker picks them up. So these are missing kids does not mean they are trafficking victims or they have been trafficked yet, um, but we're trying to find them before it gets to that point. These are a picture of all of our different routes that we go on for outreach. So we have campuses, we have 12, 10 campuses in Texas, and then one in uh, Oklahoma, and then one in North Carolina as well. So slowly growing and expanding, um, but going on all these different routes and spreading awareness and taking those missing kids posters to business owners. So our South Carolina campus. And because of our partnership with For the One um, and taking these missing kids posters, we've seen 327 minors recovered and 178 um, victims of domestic sexual exploitation recovered as well. So it's really amazing that we've been able to see such a difference made. These are some photos from our safe house. Um, the bottom middle picture is a picture of our safe house. It's in an undisclosed location to keep the women safe. Um, some photos of, we have a lot of girls that have therapy dogs, um, a lot of equine therapy for a lot of the girls in the home, very healing for them. Um, and then we're actually expanding our safe house. So we just broke ground last month on our safe house expansion project. We're adding four new bedrooms and a new living room. Um, and so just that many more girls that we can take in and help through their healing process. So we're really excited about that. These are some photos from our safe house. Um, we love to celebrate the girls because that is something that they haven't gotten to experience oftentimes. Um, so holidays, birthdays, all those different things, making them feel special, making them feel celebrated, um, bringing volunteers in to do art classes with them, bracelet making, um, all of these different things, experiences that they never got to have um, as a child growing up in the trafficking industry or you know through their trauma, all these different things, just helping them live life and um, celebrate with them and make them feel loved. These are some photos of volunteers that have served in our safe house. Um, we have a lot of men that will come and serve. Obviously there's background checks done and uh, trainings they have to do to come serve at the safe house. Um, but men will come and do yard work for us and fix things in the house, build beds for the girls. Um, so it's just amazing to see how people come together um, for such an amazing cause. We had a Girl Scout troop, the bottom left photo, um, Girl Scout troop that came and built a garden for our girls in the backyard. Um, so just all different kinds of things serving um, for the kingdom of God. Some photos from our safe house. Art therapy is a huge way that the girls heal through a lot of their trauma. Um, and so there's a lot of art hung around the safe house, which is really cool. This next slide is a two minute video of one of our survivors from the safe home. She wrote a poem um, in her healing journey and she wanted us to share it with you all. City, I'm now a confident woman who knows who she is and who loves God. Hey little girl, why do you cut? And why do you flinch every time you are touched? Who treated you wrong? Who put you down? Why was your smile replaced with a frown? Why is the pain more than you can bear? Who abused you and made your heart tear? Why do you accept love in all the wrong ways? Who did this to you and taught you it's okay? Why do you cry in your bed all alone? How come you have never felt at home? Why do you walk with your head hanging low? Has nobody showed you that they love you so? Hey little girl, you know you don't have to hurt. There's a man who loves you and has gone through much worse. He lives up above and has watched you from birth. He will show you what you are really worth. His name is Jesus and he died for our sins. You may think that you know him, but meet him again. He's part of the Godhead three in one, the Father, God, the Spirit, and Son. He's not a God of anger, that's not who he is. He is a good daddy and he loves all his kids. Child, open your eyes and believe in your heart. He's waiting for you and you're never too far. 
So get up from the dirt and put on your crown. You're a child of the king, so quit looking down. You're worth more than diamonds and silver and pearl. And to him, you'll always be daddy's little girl. I love at the end how she calls God daddy because that's so restorative. Oftentimes the pimps have the girls call them daddy. And so to see her come full circle and see, no, God is actually my loving father is amazing. This is her now um, with her family. She has three kids, is happily married, um, was at our safe house for a little bit and was able to go through her healing journey um, and is doing really well now. So it's amazing to see that. <coughs> So one of the small ways that you can give back to Poema is through Amazon Smiles. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but you can connect your Amazon account with um, a foundation or a nonprofit that you want to give back. So 0.5 of your percent of your purchases will go back to Poema, um, and every little bit counts. And then another fundraising event that we have is our Bentry Bible Golf Tournament. So if you like to golf, um, I have some flyers that I can give out to you guys. But you can purchase um, one ticket or a team, um, and all of that money goes towards Poema as well while having fun golfing. And that is it. That's all I have for you guys right now. So thank you guys so much. I know that was very heavy. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a break, and then our next training will be in about 10 minutes.